This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 64 is Jungian analyst and clinical psychologist, Dr. Donald Kalshed in Santa Fe, New Mexico. After completing undergraduate work in philosophy at the University of Wisconsin, he attended the Union Theological Seminary in New York City, where he earned a Master of Divinity, specializing in psychiatry and religion. His graduate thesis was on Hermann Hesse's Damien as an example of the individuation process. He then went on to New York's Fordham University, where he earned a Ph.D. in clinical psychology and later completed the training program in analytical psychology at the C.G. Jung Institute of New York, where his diploma thesis was on narcissism and the search for interiority. He worked as a faculty member and supervisor of analytic training candidates at both the New York Association of Analytical Psychology and the Jung Institute, and served on the board of the C.G. Jung Foundation and as president of the newly formed National Board of the Archive for Research in Archetypal Symbolism. In 1986, he became head of the Institute for Depth Psychology at Wainwright House in Rye, New York, where he started the Professional Enrichment Program in Jungian Theory and Practice. He later joined the Westchester Institute for Training in Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy in Bedford Hills, where he worked as a training and supervising analyst. In 2007, Dr. Kalshed relocated to Albuquerque, where he became an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. And in 2014, he moved to Santa Fe, where he became a member of the C.G. Jung Institute of Santa Fe and a training analyst with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. He teaches and lectures nationally and internationally on the subject of early trauma and its treatment. He is the author of two widely popular books, The Inner World of Trauma, Archetypal Defenses of the Personal Spirit, published in 1996, and Trauma and the Soul, A Psycho-Spiritual Approach to Human Development and Its Interruption, published in 2013. Last week, his essay, Wrestling with Our Angels, Inner and Outer Democracy in America, Under the Shadow of Donald Trump, was published in the book Cultural Complexes and the Soul of America, Myth, Psyche, and Politics, edited by Dr. Thomas Singer, and it is the subject of our talk today. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, June 10th, 2020, through the magic of Skype. Hi, Dr. Kalshed. Hello, Laura. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, Thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. A new book edited by Jungian analyst and psychiatrist Dr. Thomas Singer was released by Routledge last week. It's called Cultural Complexes and the Soul of America, Myth, Psyche, and Politics. It's a collection of 16 essays by a variety of people, including speaking of Jung guests Jerome Bernstein and Jeffrey Keel. Your contribution is an essay titled Wrestling with Our Angels, Inner and Outer Democracy in America Under the Shadow of Donald Trump. It's chapter four in the book in part one, which is titled Meta Themes in American Cultural Complexes. And you open the essay with this rather famous quote of Jung's. It's from his face-to-face interview with the BBC in 1959. He said, the world hangs on a thin thread. And that thread is the psyche of man. We are the great danger now. Psyche is the great danger. Well, um, that quote has always been uh, very intriguing to me. And uh, probably over the course of the last 50 years of, of practice and reading and study, I've been trying to figure out what Jung meant. And, you know, his conception of the psyche was unique and and very special because he added a whole layer to the psyche that was not understood by psychoanalysis in the early days. He he added what he called uh, a sub basement to the his model of the uh, psyche of the unconscious itself, which he called the objective psyche or the ground plan or the collective unconscious. And in that. Uh, 
Jung added that uh, layer to to his model of the psyche, I think, because he he had profound experiences uh, of a of a very powerful archetypal force or forces in the in the unconscious that outpictured themselves as images that were universal that that found um, that he found in in myth and symbol all across the the cultures of the world. Mm-hmm. And also in personal dream material from his patients. So he felt that unless he added that that deeper layer to the psyche, he um, he wouldn't be honoring the best understanding of some of the material he was getting from his patients and the things that really excited him about the connections between his patients' dream material and these universal themes. Now... The reason for me that that's important um, is that the archetypal psyche contains powers that um, are beyond human. They are uh, when we call when we talk about archetypal affects and archetypal images, we're talking about what the early literatures talked about as the titans, um, the giants the extraordinary beings that populate early mythology, the, the gods and goddesses and their emissaries. So that uh, another one of Jung's uh, contributions is that spiritual realities that come to us in terms of visions and images uh, that are very powerful and oftentimes very transformative are mediated through this layer of the unconscious. So this is our inheritance. Um, we are born with this depth dimension, and it provides us uh, with access to a world that transcends in its power and its uh, imagery the normal walk-around ego world that we all participate in in material reality. It's, um, in other words, we are creatures of two worlds. We we. We live between these two worlds, uh, between the worlds of eternity and time, between the worlds of the inner world and the outer world, uh, between the material world and the spiritual world. We're born of spirit as well as matter, and spirit comes through the collective unconscious, through the archetypal world, and impacts us. and is the source of our religious longings and the source of our religious beliefs. They take shape around those archetypal images that Jung uh, located in the collective unconscious. Now, um, this is a long-winded way of trying to introduce what I mean in my essay about wrestling with angels, because mm-hmm. um, one of the one of the realities that we all have to contend with is that archetypal levels of the collective psyche come to us in terms of very powerful affects. Um, I sometimes use the analogy of 880 volts of electricity that arrives at our house um, and on the telephone pole outside of most of our homes there's a thing called a transformer. And that transformer transforms 880 volts into 440 and then 220 and then 110. And then we can use it for the energies that we need in our homes. But the original input from the brainstem, from the powerful affects that course through an infant's little body, are from our archetypal energies. And the transformer in human relationships or the transformer in in psychology are human relationships. So instead of a box on a phone pole, we have the relationships that a child goes through uh, in early development. And so when the child is overwhelmed by terror uh, or rage or even love, um, the, the parent helps name that affect with language uh, helps hold the child when the child is overcome with that affect, helps metabolize and integrate that affect so that it takes on a human form. Now, the way these affects appear in uh, 
in, in early dream materials is as monsters, demons, angels, overpowering, uh, superhuman, uh, preternatural creatures. And um, now we're getting closer to my essay because um, I think, you know, one of the one of the primary things about American democracy and about any democracy is that it's a it's a system of dialogue among people who present very powerful feelings about uh, highly polarized ideas. The other thing that I might mention about the archetypal psyche is that it, the archetypes are all in antinomies or opposites. They come up as the great good uh, savior and the antichrist. They come up in terms of good and evil. They come up in terms of light and dark. And so the polarization that we find in our culture right now is is highly uh, caused by by the eruption of these very strong emotions, these overwhelming uh, emotions that erupt in terms of opposites, good and evil, right and wrong, uh, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so we have to wrestle with these powerful affects, with these angels and demons, if we're going to have a democracy. One of the terms that a lot of people struggle with, myself included, is the term archetype. And I've mm -hmm. heard you say that what it means is archaic and typical. Right. And you're saying now that they come in pairs of opposites. They come uh, in pairs of opposites at the image level. They mm -hmm. come with very powerful polarizing emotions at the affect level. Um, Jung emphasized mostly the image level of the archetype. He got very fascinated by the fact that dream images uh, frequently, let's say the image of a divine child or a child of light, uh, that those images come up in people's dreams quite frequently. And uh, he's not the only one to have discovered that. Mm -hmm. Sander Ferenzi found these miraculous uh, babies, these oracular babies, uh, coming up in the dreams of his patients. And he, he coined the phrase, the wise baby dreams. Uh, for Jung, uh, these images are archetypal in the sense that they they give expression of a very powerful image of, um, of a child who often uh, has a dual destiny. This child comes up in archetypal material, for example, uh, uh, with, a, with a heavenly father and an earthly mother, say, so, that, so he has a dual progeny, and such as the Christ child, for example. Um, but that image is far bigger than Christianity. That the the image of the divine child is is worldwide and and finds a very prominent place in in all the religions of the earth. So uh, Jung got very fascinated with the image of the divine child. Now he didn't talk as much about the affect level of the archetype, and the affect level of the archetype is primal, primordial. Uh, emotion, 880 volts of emotion. Right. And so uh, we have to talk about affect as much as we talk about image. As a matter of fact, um, the Jungian understanding is that dreams are made of affect images. Uh, the, the affect uh, from the body and the image from the mind, the, the affect from the materia of the body, the image from the spiritual dimension of the mind, the celestial unconscious, so that we have a celestial unconscious and a somatic unconscious. And when the two come together, we get a meaningful image, an image that, um, uh, that expresses uh, the instinctual level of the body and, and primal affect on the one hand, and a meaning dimension of form giving uh, logos dimension of the spirit uh, world on the other. So, so dreams are made up of of archetypal images and affect images. So, maybe that's a, a, a definition. I hope it's helpful. In the beginning of the essay, you say you're going to try to articulate and describe how two psychologies, a democratic psychology on the one hand, and a dissociative psychology on the other 
are in a struggle for our national psyche, with a dissociative psychology lately getting the upper hand. Correct. So let's start with the fact that for Jung, the psyche in its healthy form, and I'm talking now about an integrated ego Mm -hmm. that is resilient and flexible and can relate to the outer world and can relate to the inner world. And that's what we all hope for uh, in our developmental history. The psyche is in its healthy form a democracy. Now, what he means by that is Uh, We all have these parts of ourselves that um, emerge over the course of our development and our lives. And often these parts represent different discrete affects, different discrete feelings. Um, For example, the feeling of vulnerability and uh, innocence might be uh, represented as a child, a a vulnerable child. Mm -hmm. Um, fear, the, the feeling of terror and fear might be represented by a rabid wild animal or a monster attacking us. Um, and, you know, the parts of us are partly from the inside, from our discrete affects. And there are, you know, depending on which theorist you listen to, there may be seven, eight or ten primary affects. Um, and they're also shaped and formed these these inner figures by our experiences with other people and especially with our mother and our our parents Mm -hmm. and and father in the early developmental history so so we all have these different parts of ourselves Um, Jung was not by any means the first to discover this but he was uh, he was eloquent in his description of these different part selves and these different part selves in a healthy personality have to go together. They have to be integrated. Yeah. And uh, in other words, they, there has to be a, a forum, uh, a Senate, we call that the ego in which these different parts can be represented and can, uh, can, can be honored and respected as a part of the whole. Now, sometimes this is very difficult because if you were raised, raised, say, in a highly religious uh, atmosphere, it's possible that the sexual parts of your life and your feeling life and your inner life are not going to be welcome in the ego structure that you have. And so they will be repressed and consigned to the unconscious. This is, in Jungian language, shadow work. Mm -hmm. Uh, We all have a a doppelganger, a a part of ourselves that grows up along with the ego that represents the parts of us that are not comfortable in the ego's social identity. So those parts get pushed into the unconscious where they take on all kinds of uh, grotesque forms and feel quite rejected and alienated and embarrassing and cause us no end of problems. But the point is, as they are integrated in the ego, we get a democratic ego, we get a democratic psyche. Okay. Now, dissociative psychology is an entirely different ball of wax. Um, and, uh, well, let's take the example I just gave uh, of, say, sexual feelings or aggressive feelings that are a natural part of all of us that are not permitted in a, say, a, a, a very strict rigid uh, household um, or religious upbringing. Those parts get repressed into the unconscious in a in a psychology that is neurotic and not psychotic. However, if the restrictions and the constrictions and the trauma background of the person who is suffering those feelings is very severe, then those feelings will be dissociated instead of just repressed. In other words, they will not just exist in the, in the upper layers of the unconscious, the personal mm-hmm. unconscious, uh, but they will, they will recede into the deeper darkness of the collective unconscious where they will join forces with very powerful energies and feelings. And they will then they will then be dissociated from the ego. The ego will not know about them. And so the return of them 
uh, will be a, a catastrophe for the ego and will result in severe dysregulation. Mm -hmm. It's not like you'd be embarrassed if your sexual uh, feelings were you were reminded of them in a in a situation socially. It's that you would um, be more than embarrassed. You would you would split off. You would go into a dysregulated state. Um, you might have a panic attack. Uh, whatever. So dissociative, a, a dissociative psychology, you know, one of my specialties in, in the field of, of, of Jungian psychology is in early trauma. Mm -hmm. And I got very interested in early trauma because some of my patients uh, could not remember anything of their childhoods, could not remember anything of their feelings as children and had a general lack of capacity or liter emotional literacy in terms of their access to their feelings. And what we began to realize in, in working with their dreams is that fragments of memory and feeling were coming back through the dreams that they had no conscious awareness of. In other words, these experiences were so painful when they first occurred and the ego was so immature and weak and young that very powerful defensive structures came up to compartmentalize those feelings and those memories so that the people didn't know about them anymore. I've always been very curious when listening to you talk or reading your work as to why some children can, I don't know, I don't want to say brush off, but sort of absorb situations or experiences and not be traumatized by them. So some children will experience situations that are extremely traumatic, but they're not, I don't know how to say this, it's not like it has to be a horrible, uh, violent incident. It could be being neglected or not being paid attention to or being called a name. So why do some of us, can some of us kind of handle that and others are completely traumatized by it? Well, let's start that conversation with the realization that we're all more or less traumatized. We've all experienced trauma. Life right. is traumatic. Yes. Uh, one of the basic structures of the human condition or, or features of the human condition is the fact that we're all given more to experience in this life than we can bear to experience consciously. So that's a good definition of trauma. Just too much experience to, to, to really experience it. So defenses come in to help us segment and, and compartmentalize that experience so that we don't have to experience a traumatic childhood all at once. We can do it in stages. Why certain people end up with a uh, severe defensive structure, a dissociative psychology, mm -hmm. Is and others don't, is a very good question. I mean, some people are more resilient than others. Some people are innately sensitive. Mm -hmm. Elaine Aaron, one of my colleagues out in the West Coast, has written wonderful, wonderfully about the highly sensitive person. And it's now well known that some people are just extraordinarily attuned to feeling life and, and, um, and extremely sensitive. They're going to be much more traumatically injured by, uh, say, a rageful alcoholic father mm. than than other kids who aren't aren't structured that way. Some kids come in with a, a much more sort of uh, resilient uh, psychology, and and you never know. I mean, kids are protected by siblings. It, uh, different siblings have entirely different upbringings in, in a family. Right. They have an entirely different experience of the parents. So it's, it's really difficult to say. It's one of those mysteries of the work. Uh, I mean, it's always a question that's intrigued me as well. But um, I'm more interested, uh, in, not so interested in the question of why, as I am when I get somebody in my consulting room who is in incredible pain mm -hmm. and can't feel it. Um, I'm more interested in how to reach that pain and how to heal the dissociative psyche than I am in all the questions about why. So, mm -hmm. so let me come back to 
this essay that that's in this book of, of Tom Singer's. We start with the understanding that for Jung, a healthy psychology is a democratic psyche. And a an pathological psyche, no fault of anybody's, because there's been too much experience to experience, is a dissociative psychology. Now, dissociative defenses are something that Jung spoke about a lot in reference to what he called the complexes. But he didn't give it the, sa- the central place in his model of the psyche as I do in mine. In my experience, um, dissociation takes many more insidious and pathological forms than just complexes. Mm-hmm. Um, this, uh, dissociative psychology is a, um, a system. I call it the self-care system. Mm-hmm. But it's uh, very violent forces in the psyche that come to the aid of the beleaguered child and violently cut it off from its own vulnerable feelings. So what you get is a structure. I call it the self-care system. And I've used my favorite image for the self-care system that shows these affects, these very powerful, repressive and oppressive affects is Blake's image, um, which is on the cover, actually, of my of my 213 book, uh, Trauma and the Soul. It shows two angels and a child, and the child is obviously terrified uh, of the dark angel in the system. The dark angel is the violent one, um, and the violent one is reaching out to try to sequester the child or pull it into its sort of netherworld lair, whereas the bright angel is holding the child away from the dark angel and trying to protect it from the violence that's implied in the dark angel. Now, if you look at the iconography of the of that dark angel and you follow it into Dante, you, you find out that his name is Dis, D-I-S, mm-hmm. and he lives at the very bottom of hell Uh, surrounded by fire and ice, and he devours the sinners that have fallen into his realm. So, you know, dis is a perfect name for dissociation. It's the it's the root word from which we get disease, dissociation, disembodiment, even disaster, which means to be split away from your own stars. So these very powerful angelic and demonic beings are part of the inner system that destroys a democracy of the psyche and pulls everything into a split totalitarian regime so that we're really talking about a totalitarian fascistic system that dominates that's a, that's a word recently used by our illustrious president mm-hmm that dominates the vulnerable uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the injured, the in, insecure, the inferior uh, feelings in, in the personality, dominates them and, and uh, sequesters them and encapsulates them inside a system that won't let the vulnerable child out into the world ever again, because the system is trying to prevent the person of the trauma victim from ever being traumatized again. Its motto is sort of like the Jewish Defense League. Never again will there be a Holocaust like we've experienced. Never again will we, the defenses, allow this to ever happen. Now, this psychology, this dissociative psychology, is driven by one primary affect, and that's fear. Mm -hmm. And right now in this country, we have a a very powerful fear-driven dissociative psychology and democracy, which which holds that everybody gets a seat at the table, even the downtrodden, uh, even the looters, even the police that kill people, everybody gets a seat at the table and we have to work out um, an integration of these split and powerful dynamics. Uh, That's what's uh, being tested right now in the streets all over the country. It's a remarkable um, eruption 
of a you know the of a democratic structure on the streets of America, the white and the black and all the colors in between, the Rainbow Coalition, which is is um, is making the point that Black Lives Matter. We we cannot dominate, overwhelm the least fortunate among us, the the people who were previous slaves. So that's this that's the core of the essay. I don't know, does that leave you any place to get in, Laura? <laughs> well, I was just looking at some notes I had pulled out of your article. You said, whether on the left or right, the particular dissociative psychology I am describing thrives in times of great existential anxiety or instability, such as we live in today. So yes, I was hoping you would talk about that. Well, let's just look at what we're living in today. Mm -hmm. The... Um, the COVID-19 has brought us all face to face with our exquisite human vulnerability. Yes. Has, I mean, um, we're all frightened, uh, terrified, really, about mm -hmm. premature death from this thing. We're watching the bodies pile up. Um, and so it, it brings us face to face with that feature of the human condition, just how how fortunate we are to be alive um, how fortunate we are to be in relationship with people we care about mm -hmm. and how utterly fragile we are. Um, then you add to this the, um, the realities of what we're doing unconsciously to the planet, consciously and unconsciously, really. Right. The fact that, uh, you know, we are in what's been called the sixth extinction. The fact that, that, um, the climate is warming much faster than than we even even the the naysayers predicted, and the fact that you know we are doing this without really reflection, without without consciousness, we're dissociated. We're in a dissociative psychology when it comes to the climate. Um, we're not in a conflict psychology. In a conflict psychology, we would be sitting down with ourselves. And saying, my God, what are we doing? What are we doing to the earth? What are we doing to the animals, to the butterflies, to to fragile life on the planet? But we don't do that. We 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 rush on, um, you know, organized around like skipping stones over the f face of the water. You know, as fast as we can go, we we don't slow down so that we can sink into the realities of what we're perpetrating on the on the planet itself. You know, the incidence of of violence, we're in an age now which is unprecedented, where individual people uh, with with the technology of violence that we have created, including high powered rifles, individual people can take down a whole school of innocent children. It's terrifying. Or you know, men with uh, very strange religious beliefs can take box cutters and fly airliners into, into, uh, and bring down whole buildings. I mean, this is this is absolutely unprecedented. Hackers can completely destroy uh, the internet. Uh, you know, somebody sitting in a bedroom in Russia somewhere can have this kind of power, and so fear is exacerbated, and and we all become extremely anxious. Uh, anxiety is that we don't allow ourselves to really feel um, and around which our dissociative defenses accumulate uh, so that we don't have to feel these things. I mean, uh, you know, a great deal of what's going on in the culture right now, you know, under the title of fake news is a denial of these realities that um, that we really have to face as a people. But weaker personalities and people who are riven by fear and don't want to look at reality because they can't bear the feelings of grief that come up, um, create an alternative reality. I mean, uh, I don't know whether you know of Alex Jones. He's somebody oh, yeah. that I talked about in my article. Mm -hmm. um, the, the massacre that occurred at Sandy Hook with the massacre of over 20 innocent young children by Adam Lanza um, was the slaughter of the innocents that, that was, was a piece of reality of American culture that most of us 
you know, we're in tears about, we're mm-hmm. in grief about. We could we could barely even think about it. Uh, Alex Jones, who is a conspiracy theorist and who invited Trump on his show during the 216 election, uh, said it never happened. It was a false flag operation that uh, never happened. It was staged with actors. And uh, this is the kind of denial of reality. Conspiracy theories do it very well for us. If it's the deep state or it's anti-fa, Trump's latest conspiracy theory is that that the man who was pushed down by Buffalo police and severely injured was an anti-fa uh, conspiracist. And uh, so we don't have to look at the vulnerability that we're creating, the injuries that we're creating, the unfairness of our society, the unfairness of our police forces. We just have to create an alternative reality. That's what a dissociative psychology does. It, it changes reality. We can't bear the conflict that this is us. A democratic psychology can see both the good in ourselves and the bad in ourselves. Mm-hmm. Take responsibility and take responsibility for our own complicity with evil and grieve it and move into a, a compassionate response to the people we've injured. A dissociative psychology can't do that. And you mentioned conflict psychology. Would you tell us what that means? Yes, a conflict psychology is just what I was saying. For example, a conflict psychology would would be manifested on the street. I don't know whether you saw the video of the man, the 70 plus man that was pushed down on the Buffalo streets and then walked, the, the police pushed him down and then continued right on. One of the police officers there had a conflict with what had just happened. Mm -hmm. He didn't feel right about what had just happened. He bent down to try to help this elderly gentleman. His his buddies on the police force pushed him away and they continued on down the street. Mm -hmm. So a conflict psychology can hold um, the good and the bad in the same in the same ego. Uh, It can hold with guilt the ways in which we've hurt people. It can hold with guilt and and compassion our own tendency towards racism in this country. It can hold it and it can try to make reparations. Um, In other words, but you have to realize to, to be able to hold that conflict, the awareness that we, despite our good intentions, create evil in the world, to hold that requires great affect tolerance yeah. or emotional literacy. It's not easy. It's it's the work of democracy and it's the work of psychology. We, we're doing that all the time in psychotherapy, trying to get people to, to integrate and face and bring into the, the court of the ego all the parts of themselves that they have marginalized and and pushed away and who they have have designated as bad parts of the self a conflict psychology can hold that a dissociative psychology is weak it can't hold it and so it develops defenses against it and one of the major defenses is to vilify shame and marginalize Look what Trump is, is uh, the, the adjectives that he's used about immigrants. You know, we're a nation built on the welcoming of immigrants. And yet Trump, out of his fear of immigrants, uh, vilifies them and calls them all rapists and drug addicts and build a wall, you know. That is reminding me of the cover of this new book, Cultural Complexes and the Soul of America. It really stunned me to see the image that's used for the cover. It is the Statue of Liberty kind of half buried in the sand. And that is from the final scene of the film Planet of the Apes, which was released in 1968. I was born in New York City, and I grew up there and then in New J- northern New Jersey. And 
All four of my grandparents, including my mother, came to the United States from Italy through Ellis Island. And I remember seeing that movie, Planet of the Apes, at a drive-in movie theater with my parents in New Jersey. And I remember that scene when the astronaut there sees that Statue of Liberty and realizes that he never left Earth, that this was the Earth at war people at war on the earth. And that image haunted me my whole life. And then I see it on the cover of this book. And the book is titled Cultural Complexes. And I was wondering if you would explain to us, I've I've covered the Jung's concept of the complex a lot on this podcast, but we've only just touched on a little bit the cultural complexes. Well, I guess the easiest way to imagine what a cultural complex is, is that um, there are personal complexes, say the inferiority complex, right? Um, The inferiority complex is a classic personal complex where our inferior feelings um, are pushed into the unconscious by our defenses. The defenses have to do with the, you know, the way we want to appear to the outer world and they push the inferiority and the the parts of ourselves that we consider bad into the unconscious. And then they they, um, persecute that that unconscious content and keep it locked up inside, right? It's a kind of system of inner slavery. Mm -hmm. Well, that same that same psychology can leak out into the or not leak out really, but be manifest in the outer world in something like the slave uh, experience that this country has been through, Mm -hmm. uh, where a whole race of people was oppressed and repressed and turned into objects to be sold. Well, we're still living with the sequelae of that repressive, dissociative psychology um, now. I mean, Lincoln was the great emancipator, the great integrator. Uh, If there is ever a man uh, in our history who embodies the capacity for a conflict psychology, it's Abraham Lincoln. Because he realized that that this whole dissociated uh, people who were judged inferior needed to be integrated and emancipated in the country. It's he realized that if democracy were going to earn its 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 wings, it had to it had to do this integration. He, these slaves had to be freed. Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't just one act uh, of the emancipation and the Civil War. Then the South refused the reconstruction that that Lincoln offered, and uh, the oppression of black peoples has continued for years since, and it's it's continuing on the streets with with George Floyd. Uh, so it's it's this that's the way the cultural complex proceeds from and reflects and embodies interior complexes. How did we go from coronavirus fear, lockdown? I've been in lockdown since March 11th. Uh, we, we were put on shelter in place, and. Mm-hmm. All of Chicago is still mostly closed. I know some states and some cities are starting to reopen. It's been very slow going here in Chicago. So here we are in June, uh, still on lockdown. And Mm -hmm. the protesting, the rioting, and the looting, I know in other cities it's been just as bad here in Chicago. It's been pretty awful. Would you say that that was some sort of compensation for the lockdown and the fear of the coronavirus, like you were talking about earlier, about this fear that we're all living in about death and watching the bodies pile up? Well, you know, people have have said, I've heard people say, you know, uh, this was a perfect storm. Everybody was cooped up and locked down and... um, Everybody wanted to erupt and get out and throw off their masks and demonstrate about something real. Uh, That may be a factor. My own view of it is a little different. I I think the COVID um, plague uh, pandemic has 
torn the masks off of some of the deepest inequities in our society. Um, you know, it's it's put so many people out of work. It's unmasked the way the wealthy are able to get tested, the way the wealthy are able to live in their little uh, enclaves, unaffected really by by the scourge and the ravaging of our society by the virus, the way the the wealthy can get to hospital beds and so forth. It's it's unmasked all kinds of levels of of inequity, unfairness, and and um, the separation between the rich and the poor, the haves and the haves nots, the blacks and the whites. It's really pulled the mask off of that. And so I'm not surprised that um, that it that it took you know that this was the match that ignited. Um, and I I feel quite hopeful because the outpouring you know this isn't just an american thing about police brutality it's it's now it's now become worldwide um it's about it's about trying to find a way to make some inroads in the totalitarian oppressive psychology that's behind the police brutality it's um you know it the police are victim of this system too uh, you know, my whole work has been on trauma and discovering this system inside the psyche, which is really a system of slavery. Mm-hmm. It's a system in which powerful parts of the psyche that are connected to our ideal identity and the way we want to present ourselves and our strength and our power, uh, the way they take over the vulnerable portions of the personality and oppress it and push it into the background I mean, this this is the major feature of of the difference between a conflict psychology and a dissociative psychology. Okay. There's an inner fascism. There's an inner s- slave system in the psyche, and it we we have better access to it or easier access to it out in the world because in the inside of the psyche it's invisible. Uh, we get oppressed and we become tyrants, but we can't. We can't see our own fears. We can't see the ways in which these powerful archetypal forces are taking us over from the unconscious. We can see it in the streets where the police who have archetypal power are are oppressing human beings who don't. And so, you know, um, why why the 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 covid and the the black lives matter things came together is 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 a mystery to me but i'm i'm just talking out loud about how i think some of these things may go together mm-hmm. um i think it's the vulnerable our own vulnerability has been exposed and and i think there's there's a voice somewhere speaking in this mess that we have to start honoring that vulnerability, the vulnerability of the earth, the vulnerability of black and brown people, our own vulnerability, uh, and and not oppressing it and driving over it with our ego-driven, money-making driven, uh, power-dominated, you know, it's this dominion ethic. Um, the, uh, the, the, the archetypal powers, you know, will will take over if they're not humanized. It's it's that business of transformation. It, it's like the power of life and death, the power of good and evil. They they find their way into our national debate and and then they get humanized. Then we find somebody who's actually suffering under the the great boot of the of the police who with their powerful weapons and their and and you know their entitlement and and then we we suddenly feel well wait a minute this isn't right this is this is these are human beings that are being brutalized what are some ways that we can honor our vulnerability our own vulnerability we can start with uh saying to somebody uh you hurt my feelings how often do you hear that mm, not often instead of getting angry and retaliating, you mean? That's right. I mean, the defensive structure is that anger protects vulnerability. Yeah. That's the self-care system. So more likely than not, if we get hurt, um, we never say, 
first of all, we don't reflect on that hurt. We don't uh, we don't have an emotional literacy enough to 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 be able to let ourselves know that we're hurt. So the anger comes up immediately to protect us. Uh, and so we dissociate the hurt and we create the hurt in the other. And that's, you know, that's a basic dynamic of sadomasochistic relationships that find their way into domestic violence and everything else. You know, um, we we react with rage first and then we get to the hurt after we've created it in the other and mm-hmm. can see. Mm-hmm. So, um you know, the capacity to be aware of our own fragility, our own very sensitive natures are just how how fragile we are. I mean, it's a, it's I, I like to think about it as um, as just what one example of how much fear there is in people is the National Rifle Association. The National Rifle Association is made up of the most terrified people on the planet. Everybody in the National Rifle Association is afraid of being robbed of their defenses. And the whole thing is structured around an image of innocence, American innocence, American exceptionalism, the innocent person that's killed by the bad, evil person with a gun. So the only thing the National Rifle Association can uh, can say is, you know, their 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 mantra of fear is they are going to take our guns away. Mm-hmm. They are going to take our defenses away and leave us vulnerable. So this is this is what we're up against. I mean, the NRA is is a classic example of a dissociative psychology. If we want to if we want to protect ourselves from our our exquisite innocent vulnerability getting hurt, we just get more weapons and bigger weapons. We arm our schools. You know, the only solution for a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. We can't sit down together in a conflict psychology and talk about our differences. That's what democracy is, and that's what democracy does. You say extraordinary injuries to the psyche give birth to extraordinary defenses. And I was thinking about that when I toured an aircraft carrier when I was in San Diego a few months ago. And I also uh, helped teach English to a Tibetan Lama um, who I met when he was on tour here in the United States. He's back at the monastery in South India. And we Skype once a week. And when the virus came around, they went in lockdown too. And the next time I saw him on Skype after that, uh, and I asked him about how things were there. You know, there are over 3,000 monks in this monastery and what their experience of lockdown was. He started laughing. He started giggling. And and I asked him why he was laughing. And he said, we're all so afraid of this virus, this, that we can't see. It's invisible. We can't see this virus. We have these big guns. Right. We have these bombs. All this ammunition, these big defense systems, right. look, at, look at the defense in the United States. And he said, we can't do anything about it with that. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, when you think about the proportion of our gross national product that is devoted to defense in this country, you, if, you, if, you, if you had a personal psychology that had 700 billion dollars of, mm. of its you know of its energy devoted to defense you'd have a very sick person mm. you'd have a very fear-ridden traumatized person now i know that we need a defense we all need defenses yes the united course. states needs defenses but the amount of of energy and uh, politics that's spent on on um, fear-mongering and uh creating uh, terrifying monsters out there that we then have to defend against. Uh, you know, how many wars have been fought? You know, look what George Bush did with Saddam Hussein. He made him into an evil person and then unleashed shock and awe on him and killed hundreds of thousands of innocent yes. civilians. So this is the nature of the psyche. And this is why Jung said psyche is the problem now. The psyche uh, at its deepest root 
has to experience safety in order to flower. If it's frightened, if it's traumatized, if it's full of fears and full of defenses against those fears, then uh, then it becomes totalitarianism. Then 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 we're in a very unsafe world. Uh, democracy is is an absolutely incredibly beautiful accomplishment on the face of the planet, and that's why I I have such a deep reverence for American democracy. In at its best, uh, it's a it's a it generates consciousness because democracy, you know, consciousness comes about through a dialogue between opposing positions. Mm. So consciousness mm. comes about through the opposites and democracy allows the opposites to exist in one place, Republicans and Democrats, not that they're talking to each other these days, but you get the point. Um, it's, it's consciousness it, uh, comes about through a democratic process within the psyche and between people in in governmental polities it's it's a it's our salvation on this earth if we can increase it and and develop the emotional uh, capacity to have it inside ourselves first as a democracy within Yes, and it just reminds me of another one of my favorite quotes of Jung's is from the face-to-face -face interview when he said, we need more psychology. We need more understanding of, of human nature because the only real danger that exists is man himself. He is the great danger and we are pitifully unaware of it. We know nothing of man, far too little. His psyche should be studied because we are the origin of all coming evil. And that's why this podcast exists and why I'm so honored to be speaking with people such as yourself, Dr. Kalshed. Is there anything else that uh, you would like to cover that we haven't already? Uh, no, I'd like to just uh, add to your quote. We are the origin of all coming evil and we are the origin of all coming good. Yes. Uh, we're we're going to be the origin of both. Or And, and so... By owning the evil and taking on the darkness in ourselves and taking responsibility for our own complicity with evil, and we all have that, as well as innocence, uh, we, we are doing something very important about increasing the possibility for full aliveness on this beautiful planet that we have the privilege of living on. So thank you, Laura, for this opportunity to talk with you. Please visit the website Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And it will be available later in the week on our YouTube channel. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or tune in. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. So with special thanks to Routledge, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. Speaking of Jung